Hello, I'm Nick, and this is Today in Philosophy of History for Saturday, 3 February 2024. It is the 115th anniversary of the birth of Simone Weil, who was born in Paris on this date in 1909. Weil lived a short life, very short life, and died at the age of 34 in 1943. In spite of her short life, she left a significant body of work. Much of it I would characterize as being of a devotional character, but given that she is a, a great writer and a great thinker, her devotional writings transcend the, the ordinary run of the mill. So I'm not intent, I'm not trying to um, cast aspersions on her writing by saying they're of a devotional character. I hadn't thought about Vi in relation to philosophy of history until I happened upon a paper by Bennett Gilbert titled Simon Vi's Philosophy of History, and that prompted me to look further into her work in the, in the spirit of philosophy of history. I had read one biography of uh, Vi. There are about 20 of them. I read the one by Francine Duplessis Gray, and I skimmed some of her books, mostly because her life interested me, not so much her thought. So what made her life interesting? She, I don't know if you could say played a lot of roles or had a lot of experiences, but she certainly um, maximized her what little time she had. Uh, she was a student and graduated from the Ecole Normale Supérieure. Uh, she was a friend of Trotsky, a factory worker, a soldier in the Spanish Civil War, and uh, worked with General de Gaulle in the Second World War and the French Resistance. And as, even, as, even at the end of her life, as she was sick and essentially dying, she was making plans to organize a frontline nurses brigade, and she was going to take training as a radio operator to work as a secret agent behind enemy lines in occupied France. She was recognized already as a teenager as a real eccentric. She was called the Red Virgin because of her uncompromising Marxism. Simone de Beauvoir met Y once and she described this meeting in her book, Memoirs of a Dut Dutiful Daughter. Quote, she intrigued me because of her great reputation for intelligence and her bizarre outfits. I managed to get near her one day. I don't know how the conversation got started. She said in piercing tones that only one thing mattered these days, the revolution that would feed all the starving people on the earth. I retorted no less adamantly that the problem was not to make men happy, but to help them find a meaning in their existence. She glared at me and said, it's clear you've never gone hungry. Our relations ended right there. I realized she had classified me as a high-minded little bourgeoisie and I was angry, unquote. In 1934 and 1935, Vi was so full of passion for the labor movement that she uh, quit her job as a teacher and she got to work in factories as a machine operator. I would say that there's almost something performative about a graduate of the Ecole Normale Supérieure getting a job at a Renault plant, but she did want to share the experiences of the proletariat, you could say. And she she actually did devote a significant amount of time, about a year of her life. And she kept a journal while she was working uh, in factories, which has come to be called, I think, the Factory Journal or something similar. And it is very interesting reading in its own right. But if you read between the lines of her factory work and her military service, you get it it gets pretty clear that the people around her were well aware that she was extremely clumsy and had neither the talent nor the aptitude nor the strength for to to be a worker or a soldier. So I suspect they respected her commitment and her 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 beliefs and her ideals uh and they compensated to make it possible for her to continue to do that continue to have those experiences 
Uh, in one thing I read, it said that the when she was in the Spanish Civil War, that they tried to avoid taking her on patrols for obvious reasons. You don't want somebody like that to have your back uh, because you might get killed. But she did, you know, she tried to participate to the to the level that she was able to. You could say that that's no better than Marie Antoinette pretending to be a milkmaid. Uh, if we wanted to be charitable, we would say that she had a sincere desire to, to share in the suffering of the proletariat. And in fact, her sincerity led her to actually involve herself in these activities and not merely to, to talk about them or write about them. When I think of Vi's life, I am reminded of a passage from Walter Kaufman, who's writing about Kierkegaard. And this has stuck with me ever since I read it, uh, from his well-known anthology from Dostoevsky to Sartre. Quote, against the theoretical philosophy of Hegel and his predecessors, Kierkegaard pitted a mode of reflection closer to the individual's concrete existence. He tried to live his thoughts, at times grotesquely, as he pictures his own efforts in the point of view, but at other times, especially at the end of his life, with a complete and utter disregard for his temporal welfare, unquote. I think this almost perfectly describes Vi as well, and perhaps even describes her charitably, including the utter disregard for her welfare, because she was uh, probably permanently physically impaired by both her factory work and her, her military service. She ended up, uh, after her military service, uh, having to spend time in the hospital, and her, her parents had followed her to uh, Republican Spain and helped her to get out of that situation. But if you can live out your ideas like Kierkegaard and Vi, why would you choose to live in history? Why would you choose to live in the real world? Why settle for time when you can have eternity? The lesson notes from her lectures on philosophy when she was teaching in a prestigious girls' school uh, betrays some of her struggle to transcend time and history. Quote, Time is the most profound and the most tragic subject that human beings can think about. One might even say the only thing that is tragic. All the tragedies which we can imagine return in the end to the one and only tragedy, the passage of time. Time is also the origin of all forms of enslavement, unquote. And her lecture notes on, her, her notes to her lectures on philosophy end with this passage. Quote, there are two possible attitudes. One can either let time roll by, like a little boy with a ball of wool, or one can fill it up. This gives to the passing moments an eternal value. If one thinks of death as a passing into eternity, one has of necessity to think that there was something eternal in life. So the only problem man has to face is the struggle against time." Unquote. We know how Vi responded to the choice, as she put it there. She filled her life with the struggle against time. Uh, as I said, in these many different roles as, as writer, soldier, teacher, etc. And again, you could give a charitable or an uncharitable account of this. You could call it a form of escapism, or you could call it a form of idealism. Where do we draw the line between the two, if there is any line at all to draw? Time is a form of bondage to the, bondage to the world, and therefore it's a kind of bondage to history. Vi makes a distinction between escape from time and submission to time. Quote, all sins are an attempt to escape from time. Virtue is to submit to time, to press it to the heart until the heart breaks. Then one is in the eternal, unquote. Eternity and the eternal are almost every page of her notebooks. You might even say that eternity is omnipresent in her work. And she often contrasts, of course, eternity to time, which in her work has a demonic character. Quote, sanctity is the only way out from time. In this world, we live in a mixture of time and eternity. Hell would be pure time, unquote. 
So what I get from that is that sanctity is presumably the way out of time through submission. One does not escape time. And one could say in the same spirit that we must submit to history just as we must submit to time, not escape from history. And Vi does offer an edifying account of submission that is consistent with the idealism that one finds throughout her work. Quote, Consent and not fear of punishment or hope of reward constitutes, in fact, the mainspring of obedience, so that submission may never be mistaken for servility. It should also be realized that those who committed, those who command, obey in their turn, and the whole hierarchy should have its face set in the direction of a goal whose importance and even grandeur can be felt by all from the highest to the lowest, unquote. What is the goal? It seems clear to me that the goal is the eternal order that transcends history. And according to Vi, we do not or we ought not endure history with our teach, teeth clenched. We must submit to history without servility, always with our eye on eternity. But can we do this? given what Mircea Eliade called the terror of history, which Vi um, acknowledged in her own way, in a way you could call the atrocity of history. Quote, monotony is the most beautiful or the most atrocious thing. The most beautiful if it is a reflection of eternity. The most atrocious if it is the sign of an unvarying perpetuity. It is time surpassed or time sterilized. The circle is the symbol of monotony, which is beautiful. The swinging of a pendulum of monotony, which is atrocious, unquote. So I said that eternity appears everywhere in her notebooks. It's a, it's a touchstone for her. But I also mentioned earlier her factory journal. And I find it very interesting that in her factory journal, she uses eternal in a completely colloquial and offhand way that is, I think, illustrative of, of, of the problem here. Quote, going back to work infinitely more painful than I would have thought. The day seems an eternity to me. Here, heat, headaches, those C4 by 16 screws disgust me. It's one of those cushy jobs. I would have to do it quickly, but I can't. Barely finished, I think, by 3.30. Prostration, bitterness at stupefying work, disgust, fear, also all the time of the clutter coming, of the cutter coming loose. Nevertheless, it happens. The wait to have the cutters changed. And for the first time, I succeeded in changing a cutter myself with no help at all. And Philippe says that it's right in the middle. A victory better than speed. I also learn after another bad experience to adjust the tightness of the screw and handle at the end myself. Lucien sometimes completely forgets to tighten it, unquote. Everyone who has worked for a living will recognize these kind of conditions of labor, even if all the particulars are different. And Vi thoughtlessly called this experience of work an eternity, as it feels like to everyone who's doing repetitive, uninspiring work for hours and then for years and then for a lifetime. I'm a little surprised that she didn't elaborate on this theme of workplace monotony. She did late in her life, I think 41 or 42, write uh, another essay uh, uh, independent of her factory journals on, on labor. But she, that's a theme she certainly could have worked on. The monotony of the factory is unvarying perpetuity in contrast to the monotony, monotony as a reflection of eternity. And she said in the one passage I quoted earlier. But she admitted when she was working at the factory that she was exhausted and scarcely had time to think. Here's another quote. The effect of exhaustion is to make me forget my real reasons for spending time in the factory and to make it almost impossible for me to overcome the strongest temptation that this life entails, that of not thinking anymore, which is the one and only way of not suffering from it. 
It's only on Saturday afternoon on Sunday that a few memories and shreds of ideas return to me, and I remember that I am also a thinking being. The terror that takes hold of me when I realize how dependent I am on external circumstances. All that would be needed is for circumstances someday to force me to work at a job without a weekly, weekly rest which after all is always possible, and I would become a beast of burden, docile and resigned, at least for me. Only the feeling of brotherhood and outrage in the face of injustices inflicted on others remain intact. How long would, would all that last? I am almost ready to conclude that the salvation of a worker's soul depends primarily on his physical constitution. I don't see how those who are not physically strong can avoid falling into some form of despair, drunkenness, or vagabondage, or crime, or debauchery, or simply, and far more often, brutishness. And then in parentheses, she has, and religion, with a question mark, uh, unquote. In her factory journal, she does sound like she's barely enduring, and that she's you know, enduring time, as I said earlier, basically with her teeth clenched. This doesn't you know, speak to grace under pressure, as it were, under pressure of, of, of manual labor. So she's not managed to entirely separate time from eternity in order to transcend history, which seems to be the ideal. I quoted above that she said this world is a mixture of time and eternity. But in spite of the exhaustions she experienced in her work life, she recognized something redeeming within labor. Quote, the spiritual function of physical labor is a contemplation of things, the contemplation of nature. Passing over to the eternal is, for the soul, an operation analogous to that by which, in perception, we refrain from putting ourselves at the center of space, although perspective makes us seem to be there. And... Here again, it is the very condition for perception, the condition for seeing the real, unquote. This is a Copernican reflection. It's a decentering of the, the individual. And the in, in decentering oneself in favor of the eternal, the eternal order that should be at the center. And this perspective of the eternal is the condition for seeing what is real. We could call this a spiritual Copernicanism. And her spiritual Copernicanism explains in part her criticism of conventional providential philosophy of history, which is the only tradition in philosophy history that I can find that she engaged with. So in her, The Need for Roots, which was one of the last things she wrote before she died, she wrote... Quote, the good which is given to man to observe in the universe is finite, limited. To endure, to endeavor to discern therein evidence of divine action is to turn God himself into a finite, a limited good. It is a blasphemy. All providential interpretations of history are unavoidably situated on exactly the same level. It is the case with Bossuet's conception of history. It is at the same time appalling and stupid, equally revolting for the intelligence as for the heart. One has to be more than ordinarily sensitive to the resonance of words to be able to regard this courtier prelate as a great mind, unquote. So Vi goes on for several pages in a similar vein, criticizes, criticizing what she takes to be the shallow and misguided conception of divine providence found in Bossuet and most people who have advocated a providential conception of history. She also explicates her own conception, which is again um, coherent with her ideals and, and beautifully expressed. Quote, divine providence is not a disturbing influence, an anomaly in the ordering of the world, it is itself the order of the world, or rather it is the regulating principle of this universe. It is eternal wisdom, unique, spread across the whole universe in a sovereign network of relations, unquote. So if in passing into eternity, we remove ourselves from the center, it is 
the divine providence in splendid isolation from the human condition that takes the proper place at the center, what I earlier called the divine order or the, the eternal order rather. And we need to be able, we need to be spiritually prepared to be able to see this reality rather than to see the world in terms of the accidental circumstances which define the bulk of our lives and defines them because they are in accord with you know, what, what, what our interests are and what our wishes are and what our fears are. So there is a sense in which Simon Weil's implicit philosophy of history is a providential philosophy of history, despite her criticism of Bossuet's providentialism. We could call Vi an internal critic of providentialism who offers us a providentialist philosophy of history with a difference. But she still has more in common with other providential philosophies of history than with any other philosophy of, philosophies of history. As I said above, um, it, this is the only tradition with which she, she engages. And it is the tradition with which philosophy of history begins with Augustine's City of God. Vi has been called a Christian Platonist, specifically in the book, The Christian Platonism of Simon Vi by Jane During and Eric Springstead. Augustine is also called a Christian Platonist. It is, uh, calling him that is probably the origin of the term. Not only was Augustine the first in the Western tradition to write a philosophy of history, he was also one of the very few philosoph of his philosophers of history to also write a philosophy of time. Book 11 of the Confessions is a detailed discussion of time. And there is an enormous literature on time and eternity in Augustine. I think it would be a worthwhile project to explicate Vi's sense of time and eternity in light of all the work that has been done on Augustine's sense of time and eternity because so much work has been done there, and so little work has been done on the technical side of Vi's thought. I mean, since she is an expiring writer and her ideals come through so vividly, many people read Vi for inspiration. And like I said, there's something like 20, almost 20 biographies of her have been written. So she's an inspiring figure, but she also has um, an intellectual side to offer us that could be further developed. But I will save that for another time. So happy birthday, Simon Vibe, and thanks for listening.